If you want to understand globalization and international perspectives, we have to answer a very fundamental question and that is then what is human development. This question should come first and then we see globalization and develop in developing countries. So, so but what, what do we usually understand when we say human development? Well, usually in general when we say a, a developed country, we, we often refer to rich countries. So countries with a lot of economic power, with a lot of purchasing power, with a lot of GDP gross domestic product and in general a lot of income. Let's see what the Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stieglitz has to say about the use of GDP and income as an indicator for development. So GDP, income and economic power in general might then not be the best indicator to reflect what we mean by human development. And there are a lot of critics, including Professor Stieglitz, who, who make this claim very eloquently and very persistently. So, so what are the most important pillars of development then? What indicators should we look at? Well, for that we have to ask the best basic questions, development of, of of what? Uh, let's go a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole than to a philosophical approach towards development. For example, the famous theory of John Rawls, the theory of justice. So what Rawls, a philosopher, tells us is that the most important thing that we have to assure in a society is that it's a just society, that we have justice. Because it says once we have justice, we can obtain freedom. So from justice comes freedom. If it's a just society, freedom can be realized. And freedom, that's what development actually is. So we have freedom through justice and development through freedom. So, so how can we achieve justice in our society? Rawls proposes the following exercise. He says, justice is realized if you do the following. Let's imagine we are all together uh, in a room uh, and we design a society. We design different rules of the society. So we say if we have free education, free health care, if we have social services, if there is some kind of discrimination or not, if there's gender inequality. Now he says the special thing is that during this phase of designing we are all in what he calls the original position. So in the original position we do not actually know what place of society we will take after we have finished the designing process of society. So we do not know if we're going to be extremely smart or just average. We do not know if we're going to be strong or weak, if we're going to be a man or a woman, if we're going to be old or if we're going to be young. We don't even know our psychology, if we're going to be risk averse or if we're going to be uh, very, have a very positive outlook on life. And he says, so we are behind what he calls this veil of ignorance in the original position. And once we finish the designing process of society, the veil of ignorance is removed. And then kind of like we roll the dice, kind of like wake up and we are randomly placed at one random place in our society. It might be that we are rich or poor or, or it might not be. So and he says when we follow this procedure, we have an assurance that the outcome will be just and therefore freedom is realized and therefore development is achieved. Now that doesn't mean that there cannot be a diversity of opinion. For example, you can during the design process in the original position while you're still behind the veil of ignorance, you can say, look, I don't have any problem with the fact that poor people don't have access to education. I mean, education costs money and it's okay for me. Education should cost a lot of money and it's okay for me. Then the veil of ignorance is removed. We roll the dice and it turns out that you are a poor person. If you're fine with that, it's still, it's still cool. But if you're willing to take the risk, you know, then Rawls would still say that's still justice. You know, can be, a, you don't have to be so risk averse, but it, it still will still be justice. So uh, it is very useful sometimes to do this exercise. And I invite you to, to sit back, take some time and think about what is the society you would like to design if you were in the original position behind the veil of ignorance. What would be important for you 
for example, with regard to health, education, discrimination, job opportunities, and so forth. Think about it for a while. What would be the top priorities? Another person who thought a lot about the question, what is development, is another Nobel Prize winning economist, Amartya Sen. And Amartya Sen wrote this very nice book after receiving his Nobel Prize, it's kind of like a summary, which he called Development as Freedom. And in this book he says that the instrumental roles of freedom include several distinct but interrelated components, such as economic facilities, political freedoms, social opportunities, transparency guarantees, and protective security. These instrumental rights, opportunities, and entitlements have strong interlinkages, which can go in different directions. The process of development is crucially interconnected by these interconnections. So what Professor Sen tells us is that economic facilities like income and GDP are important, but they're interconnected and sometimes have trade-off with some other freedoms, political freedom, social opportunities, and so forth. And he fundamentally reshaped our thinking about development by proposing this multidimensional outlook on development. Over the years, Professor Sen then closely collaborated with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and together they developed what nowadays is known as the Human Development Index, the HDI. The HDI was a big revolution because instead of simply looking at income as a development indicator, it looks at different indicators. Well, basically at four indicators, in three uh, dimensions. So one we have health, health is very important, then we have education and we have living standards. So they say the basic indicator, the most fundamental indicator to see if a society is healthy is you look at life expectancy. So how long do people live? Well, because if they don't have long lives, they're probably not healthy. So that's the ultimate indicator for health. Then education is based on two indicators, expected years of schooling and the average, the mean years of schooling. And living standards includes income per capita, gross national income per capita. Uh, so the economic facilities are also important, but now we have a three-dimensional view. And their summary together is what is usually referred to as human development. While the multidimensional outlook of the human development indicator was a big revolution in the 1980s and 90s, nowadays it has many critics. Some people say, well, that also doesn't really reflect development. For example, one of the indicators that's really missing there is with regard to political freedom or transparency guarantees. So for example, you don't find any indicator for democracy in the human development indicators. Um, why do you think is that? Well, having worked at the United Nations, I can tell you it's basically because countries don't have an agreement of what actually is democracy or what is the right level of transparency and they don't permit the United Nations measures things like democracy or transparency because first of all we would have a way of measuring it. Many countries say we are democracy and other countries say no you're not so it's difficult to measure that and that's the reason why it's not, not in, uh, included in the human development indicators. But there are several alternative approaches to measuring development. For example, one recent very common approach has been that people say let's don't worry about uh, let's say the input of the development uh, process such as income or education. Let, let's worry about the outcome if people are happy. So if people are happy, I mean, we do not have to care where it comes from. I mean, they surely live good lives and we can say they are developed. They, they live in freedom, otherwise they wouldn't be happy. So these happiness studies came around and they basically work in a way that people go and make surveys with people in different countries. Now they don't ask them, are you happy or not? They ask them questions like, if you could redo a lot of things during that, that you did during the last 10 years, how many decisions would you take differently? Almost everything would you do differently or nothing would you do differently? And these are the kind of questions they ask and then from that they conclude if people are happy or not.
Now, this is a typical graph that you get if you compare income, which we have here on the x-axis. Income per capita means how rich people are. And their happiness, which we have here on the y-axis. Try to read the graph. What do you find? Yeah, so we find a, a general positive correlation between income and happiness. In general, societies that are richer are also more happy. But we find an interesting nonlinear relation here. It's not a straight diagonal relation, one-to-one -one correlation. It's, it seems that happiness goes up very quickly here at, at the beginning and then it kind of like flattens off. It's a really flat line. So there are some countries that are way down here like Colombia. They have much less income as other countries like Japan and Austri Austria, but they are just as happy. Well, why is that you think? You can explain it with the basic pyramid of Maslow's necessities, which you surely remember from high school. And that basically tells you that money, for example, can buy you love, it can buy you self-esteem. So there, there are some things that money cannot buy you. So with a general income of about fifty, sixty thousand dollars per year, actually, you already bought yourself all the happiness you can buy at the beginning. You need money in order to have. Uh, safety, to have security, to have enough to eat. But beyond this basic level, money can, can buy your happiness, which shows again that income and economic richness might not be the right indicator to measure human development or human well-being. Living in a big data world, we have many new very exciting opportunities to fine-tune the measurement of well-being, human well-being, human development. For example, here, uh, the news company Thomson Reuters created an alliance with a social media analysis company to create what they call Thomson Reuters Market Psych Indices. So basically what they do is they go through all the news items which are published in a country and through a lot of social media information. So posts on social media and so forth. They analyze that and through a process of data fusion, bring that together and they create almost 19,000 separate indices in across 120 countries, which they update almost every minute, many of them. And this is much more fine grained as uh, saying, well, this country is rich or poor, it, it tells you actually the psychological state of a country. It, level, it, it measures, for example, the level of urgency, joy, optimism, trust, gloom, conflict, anger, fear, the level of stress a country has. So actually we can look in, into the psyche of a society. For example, many investors are very interested in the level of optimism of a country before a big company does an IPO. So if you compare this kind of approach, 19,000 separate indices uh, compared with only 10, 20 years ago, where it was a big revolution that we had a three-dimensional index. So you, you can see about the exciting opportunities that also come with the big, para, big data paradigm for the measurement of human development. There are two caveats I want to leave you with in the multidimensional challenge of finding your own personal adequate outlook on what is actually human development and, and human well-being. One is that in multidimensional spaces, close and far and, and similar and different are really tricky to define. So for example, let's look at two indicators here. We have income and we have education on the x-axis. And we see that country one and country two are quite similar with regard to these two indicators of development and country three is different. Now let's see what happens if we introduce a third indicator health and we turn this entire uh, thing around. Now it turns out that in terms of education and health actually country two and country three are very similar and country one is quite different in terms of health. So now if we go back and go forth, we can see that the similarity and differences completely depends on the indicator that I choose. And these kind of funny things can happen in multidimensional spaces. 
The second caveat I want to leave you with is the fact that this definition is dynamical and it changes over time. So if we say, well, right now I consider these kind of instrumental freedoms to be necessary and sufficient, it might be that several years later uh, this has already changed due to progress, to technological progress, for example. Let's go back to Adam Smith, uh, one of the founding fathers of, of economics, and he had some very interesting ideas about that. Let's quote him literally. So he says, by necessaries I understand not only the commodities which are indispensably necessary for the support of life, but whatever the customs of the country renders it indecent for credible people, even the lowest order to be without. A linen shirt, for example, is strictly speaking not a necessary of life. The Greeks and the Romans lived, I, I suppose, in 1700s uh, very comfortably, so they had no linen. But in the present times, in 1776, so the greater part of Europe, a credible day laborer would be ashamed to appear in public without a linen shirt the want of which would be supposed to denote that disgraceful degree of poverty which, it is presumed, nobody can well fall into without extreme bad conduct, so because you're lazy or something. Custom, in the same manner, has rendered leather shoes a necessary of life in England at that time. The poorest credible person of either sex would be ashamed to appear in public without them. So back in England in 1776, you would be considered to live in poverty if you wouldn't have had a linen shirt and leather shoes. And so what is necessary and efficient then, according to Adam Smith, changes also with the custom, with the custom of a country and with the custom of time. So nowadays, the question in the digital age, for example, is, is access and usage of digital technology considered necessary and sufficient to be considered not to live in poverty. So this leads to this concept of digital poverty. Is there a fundamental instrumental freedom that tells you, well, every decent man would be ashamed to appear in public without a mobile phone? Following Adam Smith's logic, well, we could say maybe yes. And in some countries, some governments have started to finance access to the Internet as part of their social security services. In other countries, not still. But my basic message here is that what is necessary and what is poverty changes with time. So you have a multidimensional outlook and over time it also changes among others, being pushed by technological progress. And the idea of digital poverty is a very hotly debated idea right now.